Are you excited to be in the house of the, of the Lord?
Yes, come on, give him all the praise. See, yeah. Yeah. see, all week you've been told, get all you can. Save up all you can to buy that new thing. Come on, get this raise, get yeah. that, right? Get yeah. all you can, can all you get, and then sit on that can, right? Don't let anybody else have it, right? But Jesus is teaching us to be a people to give. Yeah. Jesus is teaching us to be good stewards. Yeah. Jesus is teaching us to be people who can give. Can we do that when the words aren't on the screen? Can we just raise our hands and open up our eyes and our mouth and our spiritual ears? Can we just declare our love and give it back to God? All the things he's given you, can we say you can have it all? Can we say, Lord, here it is. It's all yours anyway. God, I'm just a steward, Lord. I'm just one that takes it and distributes it to those in need. Lord, I'm just one that takes all the glory and gives it back to you. 
Let it be yours, God. Let it be yours, God. Hallelujah. There's freedom when you can give something away. Amen? Amen. And that's why we're going to continue in worship this morning and talk about giving more worship. There's a bunch of boxes out in the foyer. And these boxes are going to be a reminder to shift from taking to giving. And if there's people in your life that you know you can give food and you can give help to, let's look for those people. Let's train our brains to look for those people. If those people are not in your circle, if those people you don't run across every week, maybe we need to expand our circle. Maybe we need to go somewhere else during our week and change our routine. Yeah. Because when we give, it changes the way we do things. Yeah. When we give, it changes our lives to be more like God yeah. because He gave. Can you tell them what's John 3.16 say, Jeremy? For God so loved the world. What did He do? That he gave all that he had. One and only son. That's right. And so this morning, there's ways you can give. Go out to the foyer. Identify someone in your life. Don't do this out of obligation. Be a cheerful giver like the Bible says. But take this box. Find someone in your circle, in your path that you can give a box to this week. There's plenty in the foyer. Please grab one, all right, and give this week. There's also three more ways you can give to our church so that we can do awesome things like this. There's three ways you can give. You can uh, go to the hub. You can, uh, there's a, a little place in the back where you can do envelopes in the auditorium. And then also you can text to give. Text the word Ren Church to 77977. All right, thank you for giving your worship. Let's continue to do that this morning through our tithes and offerings. Hey, that was, hey, that was really good, Pastor. That was really good. It's good to give, man. It's good. <laughs> I got to tell you, that was good. I was like, how you got to follow that up? All right, so um, last week, I think it was last week, we gave you some cards for our summer family that we do here at Renaissance Church every, every year. And on that, we have two events that I am stupid stoked about today. You can go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. There are two events that I am stupid stoked about today. That means he's excited for those of y'all that don't speak Gen Z. The first is at 12 o'clock in Colfax. If you, want, if you are a young adult between the ages of 18 and 30, 18 and 30, raise your hand if you're between the ages of 18 and 30. Okay, some of y'all got Speaking your hands up that, 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 that ain't there. If you are between the ages of 18 and 30, we are having a pool party in Colfax, North Carolina. Watch Look out. at somebody and say, amen. Now, if you are in 6th grade to 12th grade, raise your hand. 6th grade or 12th grade? Come on, where are my young folks at? If you are in 5th age range, you are having a pool party today. Hey, let's go. Today is the day. Today is the day to be young. Sorry for those of y'all who are missing the age range. Hey, I miss the age range too, but I get to leave one of these events. So, <laughs> well, we are having these two pool parties. Uh, one is going to be for young adults. It's going to be at 12 for our youth, Vivid Youth. Vivid Youth is, is going to be at 4. And so Union Social and Vivid Youth are both having pool parties today, and we are stupid stoked to get into the sun, to get into some water. And you know what I want to do? I want to see some fools in some pools. All right? So we're going to have fun today, and we're going we gonna to rock it out. We're going to rock it out. Hey, let's do it. Right now, we want you to check out this video. we have an awesome opportunity for you to take a next step and find family on June 17th. We want you and your family to come out for Family Fun Night. This Family Fun Night is gonna be awesome because we are having a family movie night. We are watching Ch -ch 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 Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. It's gonna be fantastic, brand new movie. We want you to bring your kids, come out. We're gonna have a gourmet popcorn bar. This isn't just like some microwave stuff at home gourmet popcorn that you can make yourself and then uh, bring something comfortable. We're going to spread out all over the place, rain or shine, to watch 
Chippendale Rescue Rangers on Family Fun Night, June 17th, 7 p.m. I will see you there. Renaissance Church, Father's Day is coming right around the corner. It is Sunday, June the 19th, and we want your spouses, your husbands, the men that matter in your life, your sons, your brothers, your grandfathers, we want them all to be in this place. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have our annual bacon buffet. That just sounds so delicious as I'm thinking about it. We're also going to have an incredible prize for one lucky dad. And then there's going to be some amazing opportunities for a photo booth. And if you like loud cars, if you like really fast motorcycles, then we've got the place for you to be. So go ahead and make plans right now to be here at Renaissance Church on Sunday, June the 19th for a special Father's Day. Good morning, Renaissance Church. I am out in a landfill and I'm out here getting some work done, but I wanted to remind you of something coming up June 26th. Much like in the Bible, the children of Israel were in a dry desert place in a landfill. There's no water around here. It's hot. There's not a lot of vegetation. And that's what the children of Israel in the book of Exodus and, and Numbers and Joshua, that's where they were at. And God called them to their promise. But before they could inherit the promise, they had to pass through the waters of the Jordan River. And Jesus comes on later and he says, if you were to be my disciple, you should be baptized. You should pass through the water to inherit the promise that I have for you. And so much like the children of Israel, I challenge you to, to leave the old, dry, junky, no life places and move into a new life with God through baptism. If you have not been baptized, I challenge you to do that. I think that it's an awesome thing to do, and we will let that happen, make that happen for you on June 26th. So join us, sign up on the Hub if you're interested, and we'll see you there. Good morning. <laughs> so yesterday from nine until 10, 53 families walked through our doors and were ministered to yesterday. Yeah, you can clap, you gotta clap. Some of, some of you don't know, so we do that every Saturday. And we've been doing that since 2013. Many of you have been a part of that. But this morning, we wanna recognize one special person and his wife, and I'd like for Paul Brown and Flo Brown to come up to the front. Woo! Okay, so I remember back in 2015, we moved in this building and, and we started our food bank ministry and I'm like, every Saturday? And Paul said, don't worry, I got you. <laughs> And he's had me, like, since then. And a few months ago, he got um, promoted in his job. But he's not leaving town, thank God. <laughs> he's not leaving town. He's still, no, no. He's still going to possibly serve once a month. But I just got just to gotta give you a few statistics here, okay? So I did the math, Paul. And um, since you have been volunteering in our food bank almost every Saturday for six years, can you imagine? His only day off, except for Sunday, but then he comes to church on Sunday. So his only day off, gets here at 7.30, leaves about 10.30. He's put 11,520 miles on his car. He has spent 864 hours here. That's not counting the reporting he does every month at home, which is a couple hours a month. And the biggest thing that has been... <laughs> an awesome thing and you'll appreciate this women is those boxes of food we give away which I have been told are the largest boxes of food that any food bank ever gives away they weigh about 50 to 65 pounds it is really hard to carry those boxes from the back of the church out to the parking lot and put them in someone's car but Paul did that every week almost and is still doing that with a smile <laughs> with love when he's not here everybody asks me where's Paul where's Paul where's Paul countless countless people he has blessed 
You know, Jesus said, if you do it unto the least of these, you do it unto me. So, Paul, um, you probably got a lot of crowns in heaven, um, but you're going to lay them at Jesus' feet, right? Right. And Flo's been right beside him. She's been right beside him. He tells her, put that peas, put those peas in the box, and she does it. And we, we want to say thank you because there's no way he can do his uh, new job without um, and, and spend that much time here. So, man, you got to step up. You got to step up, man. I mean, we, we, we got ladies, but I'm going to tell you, I cannot lift those boxes anymore. Sometimes I have to. And then I have to take ibuprofen. Please step up, man. <laughs> Please, we got to have you to step up. Paul, I know God has blessed you, and there's no way we could bless you for what you've done, but I know you've done it unto the Lord, and you too, Flo. I know that you've committed that unto the Lord, and we appreciate it, right? We appreciate it. Yes, yes. was it you said this morning when I said are you going to come on stage? <laughs> well, just so you all know, the new position I, I have taken is in Alexandria, Virginia. So, oh, I'm sorry. The new position I've taken is in Alexandria, Virginia. However, the company has allowed me to do a satellite office out of Greensboro. So, I still travel from one to three weeks a month back and forth to Virginia. And it's a lot of long miles, and living in a hotel room is, is no fun. So I'm away from my wife a lot. So she's here and supporting me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. We love you. Amen. Amen. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, I was living in Columbus, Georgia. And we had a young man that was a part of our prayer group, and he lived in Phoenix City, Alabama. And Columbus, Georgia is like going from Winston-Salem to High Point. So he called us one Sunday and said, my baby's sick. We went to his home, and we prayed over the baby and the family. And the Lord healed the baby. And we were there for about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And we got ready to leave, and by the time we got to the car, he came to the door and said, my baby's dead. We went back in the house, and the mother was sitting there weeping and crying. As a medical orthopedic technician in the military, I examined the baby for vital signs, and he was dead. And I laid my hands on that baby chest and started praying because I knew the power of God. And God put breath back into that baby's lung. And that baby started crying and moving. And that was the most exciting thing for me in my life. But also, it sort of scared me. Because God moved through me to do that. And I need you to know it's not me. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit that moves through us that allow us to be a part of what God is doing. Wow, you know, um, <clears throat> thanks Pastor William for sharing that. You know, we, um, there's a song that we've sung here that has a lyric in it that says, I've seen resurrections. And when our band was looking at this song, they said, I can't sing that because I've not seen resurrections. And um, I would say from my generation down, we've heard stories of revival. We've heard Holy Ghost stories like this. Me, all of my life. And I want to see it with my own eyes. Let me, like three of you do. <laughs> I said, I want to see it with my own eyes. Yeah. By the way, you understand that in your worship and in your response to the word, you're setting an atmosphere, right? And so when you say amen and you raise your hands and you're setting an atmosphere for what the Holy Spirit can do. 
So I want to see it with my own eyes. Do you? And so uh, when they sang the song, we just changed it to from I have seen to I will see by faith, you know? Good morning, family. My name is Pastor Jason. I'm the lead pastor here. I am so glad that you are with us today. Before we jump into the Word, and God has something really special for us today, um, I just want to make a couple of really quick announcements. First of all, next Sunday. Everybody say next Sunday. Next Sunday is the most important holiday of the year. It's Father's Day. And we celebrate the most important holiday of the year with a bacon buffet. We've got Cajun bacon, fried bacon, seasoned bacon, syrupy bacon, all, any kind of bacon you want. We've got here next Sunday, we're going to have a Harley out in the lobby, I'm told, a sports car out. We're going to take pictures. We're going to give away this fire pit to a deserving young man. And because, you know, you got to see yourself as young, you know, guys, so we're all young at heart. And, and so it's going to be a great day. Statistically, Father's Day is one of the most attended Sundays of the year. We have been, I know vacation season is setting in, but we've been packing this place out. We've been running out of parking. Last week, people had to park in grass. Listen, next Sunday, Pastor Jeremy leads our greeting ministry. I want y'all to bring chaos to Renaissance Church. I want you to invite so many families and so many men to church that you make Pastor Jeremy lose his mind. I want to park people in the middle of the street if we have to next Sunday, all right? And, and, so, and so, look, in all of your chairs, these are invitations. These are not information for you. This isn't for you. Everybody say, this isn't for me. This is for a man or a family in your life who need to be in church here next Sunday. And so if you want to see revival, want to see the Holy Spirit move, you need to take this piece of paper. I better not see any pieces of paper in chairs when church is over today. Take it and give it to at least one family. And if you want to go above and beyond on the way out, our greeters will have a stack of these for you as you leave. If you want a few more invitations, let's pack this place out on Father's Day next Sunday and drive Pastor Jeremy crazy. Can everybody say amen? amen. To our guests who are here today, welcome. Dare I say welcome home. Folks who are newer to our congregation and assembly here, I want to invite you to a thing we do pretty regularly called Lunch with the Pastor. Um, lunch with the pastor will be happening today right after church. You can gather right up here. There will be a person holding a big sign that says creatively, lunch with the pastor. And it takes about 45 minutes. We will feed you. We will keep taking care of your kids. And then we can get to know each other. You can find out about our church and I can get to know you. It's an awesome, awesome time. I want to invite you to lunch with the pastor. It's no obligation. You're not signing up for anything. I'm not going to try to sell you a timeshare. None of that. I just want to get to know you and you get to know us better. Lunch with the pastor is the first step in our partnership process. Again, it's no obligation, but folks who come to lunch with the pastor who then decide, I want to call Renaissance Church my home church, they begin a partnership process. And the process takes about an hour and a half beyond lunch with the pastor. By the way, if you want to become a partner, you can go on to the hub. That's at renhub, R-E-N-H-U-B dot church and click partners. And it's about an hour and a half sort of video class that we take you through. And then you become a partner here. And our partners have said, this is my home church. I'm going to invest my time, my volunteer time. I'm going to invest my, my treasure here. Uh, as God leads me, I'm going to invest my talent here. And so I am this morning going to announce to you our list of new partners for the last month. And so feel free to clap in the middle, at the end, at the beginning, just clap, okay? So here are our new partners here. Kimberlyn Tysinger. <laughs> Jennifer Kiker Mann. Amanda Obregon. Ernesto Obregon. Chandler Brown. Marley Mallard. And Wayne Parker. So this puts our partnership total at uh, 173 partners, okay? So this is so important because the statistics tell us that every partner means that there are three people who regularly attend. And so it was about this time last year we had about 85 partners. Look at what the Lord has done at our church. Yeah. 
And I challenged Pastor Jace, who's on vacation today. I said, by the end of June next year, let's believe we're going to be at 200 partners. And we call it, y'all have never heard this. This is just internal to our staff. And we've called it our 200 partnership push. Well, we are three Sundays away. We've had so many visitors. I mean so many visitors come to our church in the last couple of months. We feel really good about getting to the extra 27. Do you love your pastors, by the way? Yeah. Do you love? So I want you to give your pastors an early past, pastor appreciation month is October. I want you to give them an early pastor appreciation present, okay? We've told our pastors when we get to 200 partners, if we do it, pastors, by the end of June, we're going to take you guys out to Chop House and we're going to celebrate, okay? And, and so they really want to go to Chop House, all right? And, um, but they got 27 more partners. You said you love your pastors. Here's your early pastor appreciation gift. Become a partner here. We need 27 of you so that these guys can have lunch. You're going to at Chop House. And, and hey, listen, I'm not above bribery. Whatever it takes to make the kingdom move, we'll make the kingdom move. If it's not sin, I'll do it, okay? And so they're going to be calling you guys. They've probably been calling you guys. And you're like, why are they calling me? One, they love you. Two, they want to go to Chop House, okay? And, and so do that. Listen, after lunch with the pastor, it takes an hour and a half. And, and then you're a part of something that is beautiful here. So I just want to encourage you, do that and become a partner. All right. Are you all ready for the Word of God this morning? Yeah. If you've got your Bibles, open them up to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We are in week 3 of our message series that we are calling Holy Ghost Stories. And you heard Pastor Williams Holy Ghost story earlier, story of resurrection, and I hadn't heard that till this morning, and it moved me. Thank you for that. This is a special season in our church. We are in the middle of 30 days of prayer, and God is moving extraordinarily. Things are happening behind the scenes. I hope to be able to share with you all at this Wednesday night's partnership summit. This Wednesday night, we're having a partnership summit to all of our partners, and we've got a lot of things. Hopefully, we can share with you partners, so... So come and, and be here for that at 7 o'clock. We're also twice a day at 2.12 praying for about 30 seconds. Everybody's getting a text, and at 2.12 every day we're praying, and I hope that's going well. But we're shifting atmospheres. We're creating an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to move. And I just want to take a moment and invite the Holy Spirit in His fullness into this room. Can we pray? Holy Spirit, we know you're already here. We feel you. But Holy Spirit, we invite you in your fullness. To come into this room. God, move our, just move our expectations out of the way so that your spirit can be free to move here today. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 So it's a special time. The Holy Spirit is moving. Uh, we, are, we are taking three weeks and we're talking about the three manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our regular everyday Christian life. If you are saved... The Holy Spirit is inside of you. The instant you said yes to Jesus, things started changing in your life because God, the Holy Spirit, took up residence in your heart. And what we have said, and you'll hear this a lot, is there are three main ways that works out, three manifestations. The first is the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about that last week, remember? The second is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that today. And then the third main manifestation, and there are others, but these are the main three the Bible talks about, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Three manifestations, three different ways the Holy Spirit shows up in our lives. And <clears throat> if there is ever confusion about the Holy Spirit, or if there is ever sort of a, I don't know if that is for me or if that's biblical, it is almost always because people don't understand that, that there are three different manifestations and they're all different. There's fruits, there's gifts, and there's a baptism. Fruits, gifts, and baptism. And we'll dig into this a little more as we talk, but today I want to talk to you about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to teach a little more today than I usually do because there's so much confusion around these ideas. Last week when I talked to you about fruit, we said there's one fruit of the Spirit with nine qualities. 
right? And, and so there's love and joy and peace, you know, and patience. And because there's one fruit, what that means is if the Holy Spirit is inside of you, you get all nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. You are entitled to it all. Now, what people will say sometimes because they haven't been taught the right thing is, well, I've got eight of them, but I'm missing one. You know, the whole patience thing, I'm, I'm just not made for patience. That's not, the, the, the Lord hasn't gifted me with patience. No, you are entitled to patience if you are saved. It is a fruit of the Spirit. There's one fruit and nine aspects of the fruit. You get it all. And so the Holy Spirit, if you are saved, is in you, giving you fruit, giving you love for that hard person. Giving you joy in a hard time. Peace and patience. Everybody gets patience. And kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You get those things. The Holy Spirit, when you're saved, begins living in your life, comforting you, in you, speaking peace to you, comforting you. <clears throat> when... Right before Jesus left this planet, Jesus called the Holy Spirit a comforter. Did you know that? Yeah. And he's, I think a little, he's talking about the fruit there. He, Jesus, in fact, said, right before he left, he, Jesus said, listen, he said, it is better for you that I go so that the comforter can come. Th th this is how important the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is so important that Jesus said, Jesus said, it's better for you to have the Holy Spirit inside of you than to have me, Jesus, walking in the flesh right beside you. And we put the Holy Spirit in the closet. So the Holy Spirit is in us to comfort us, love and joy and peace and the fruit. <clears throat> but here's the thing about being comforted. Have you ever met Christians who always just need to be comforted? Or have you ever met a person who always needs to be comforted? Like, I, uh, I once dated a girl who always needed to be comforted. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, no, baby, you are beautiful. No, 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 girl, that dress does not make you look fat. Baby, they do love you. They're not talking about you behind your back. You ever met somebody like that? You ever dated somebody like that? You ever married somebody like that? <laughs> Don't answer that question. <clears throat> Here's what I've learned about people who always need to be comforted. They're crazy. <laughs> They're always receiving comfort and never giving comfort, you know? And, and maybe crazy is like not politically correct. So let me, let me restate that. People who always need to be comforted are, um, I guess I would say high maintenance. Is that, is that a better way to say that? They're high maintenance, always receiving and never giving. And you all, if, if, if I could describe the typical American Christian, I'm not necessarily talking about Renaissance Church, unless I am. <laughs> but, but the typical American Christian, if I can use two words to describe the typical American Christian, it's high maintenance. We, we are the Christians who have a Burger King, have it your way, right away. I'm eating all of the Holy Spirit. Comfort me, Holy Spirit. We, we are that kind of Christian, stereotypically. Again, I'm not talking about you unless I am, okay? We are the Christians who love being comforted. Comfort me. We, we, we are the Christians who say things like, well, church wasn't for me today. The preacher preached... 10 extra minutes today. It wasn't for me. <laughs> the, the worship wasn't for me today. They didn't even play my favorite song today. It wasn't for me. Guess what? You're right. The worship wasn't for you. Because we're not worshiping you. Our worship team, our band, they are not up here for your pleasure. They are not up here to entertain you. Our worship team is up here to entertain the presence of God. We're here to welcome the presence of God. And why don't you all stand? Why don't you stand? I want to read 2 Corinthians 1 to you. Well, church wasn't for me today. I had to wait for three people to finish kids' check-in before I even got to the iPad. You know who you are. 
And to that philosophy, to the idea that the Holy Spirit is only here to comfort us, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 says, God comforts us. This is nothing new. We've been talking about this. This is the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And the Bible says God comforts us there, but we know that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. God is three people, and God has partitioned each person of the Trinity with certain roles and duties and obligations. You've got to know who you're talking to and talking about, right? And so God comforts us, but Jesus called the Holy Spirit the Comforter. And so we know that we're talking about the Holy Spirit here. So it could be read that the Holy Spirit comforts us in all our troubles so that, everybody say so that. I'm about to rock your world so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God or the Holy Spirit has given us. You don't hear anything else I say today. I want you to hear this. You are comforted to be a comfort. God comforted you so that you could comfort your brother or sister. We're going to move beyond the fruit of the Spirit. I want to talk to you about spiritual gifts today. Because while the fruit of the Spirit is to comfort you, it's about you. The gifts of the Spirit are not about you. Although we try to make them about us because that's who we are. Burger King, have it your way right away, Christians. The gifts of the Spirit are not about you. They are about the world around you. And I hear the Holy Spirit of God saying to us, Renaissance Church, stop being so high maintenance. Don't be so high maintenance. Before you find your way to your seat, I want you to high five a couple of people and tell them, don't be so high maintenance. Don't be so, so high maintenance. You are comforted to be a comfort. The gifts of the Spirit are not for you. They are for the world around you. Comforted to be a comfort. I think it's very interesting that the Bible uses the metaphor of spiritual gifts. Like last week the metaphor was fruit. The Bible uses gifts. I think that's interesting because at least in our culture, when I think of gifts and when we think of gifts, we usually think of what'd you get me, right? Like I think of like, what'd you get me for Christmas? I mean, we, we haven't really outgrown being little kids, have we? What toy did you get me? What's my gift? What's my gift? Right? What's my toy? Write this down. Write this down. The Holy Spirit's spiritual gifts in your life are not toys for you to enjoy. They are tools for you to deploy. What what I'm saying to you is that spiritual gifts are not toys, they're tools. They're not toys for you to enjoy, they are tools for you to deploy. Everybody say, "It's it's not a toy. It's a tool. I thought about how when I was growing up, my grandma Goins, She, for Christmas, every single year, would get me and my brother these uh, tube socks. You know, put the picture back up. Yeah, put the point back up. These tube socks. Yeah, 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 with the stripes around the top, just like that, you know. Every single year. And oh, how we hated getting those tube socks. It became a running joke in our family. wonder what grandma's getting us this year. The God-ugliest tube socks ever created, you know. And, and we hated it and made fun of it. You know who didn't hate us getting tube socks? The kids hated it. My parents. Because that meant they didn't have to buy us tube socks. You know? And, and so the parents enjoyed it, but the kids hated it. And, and, and I thought about how when it comes to the spiritual gifts of God, we really need to stop thinking like little kids. Hebrews says, it is far time that you start acting like spiritually mature adult Christians. It's not a toy. It's a tool. We wanted a toy, but my grandma got us a tool. And so because of that, we just never wore them because we resented them so much. 
And we do the same thing with the gifts of God. Because we expect God to entertain us, we, we never take on his gifts like to their full extent. We don't. We don't understand. They're not toys. They're tools. And I, I would be remiss if I don't stop here and apologize to you all. I want to apologize to you all on behalf of my people. Well, who are your people? See, I grew up Pentecostal. The Pentecostals are my people. And I want to apologize to you for my people, okay? Because, see, Pentecostals, they've, uh, they've done a really good job of introducing the world to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? But they've done almost an equally, here's the apology, they've done almost an equally good job of making the world want to throw up in its mouth when it hears about the Holy Spirit. Because what my people have done is we've taken the tools of God and turned them into the toys of man. We, we, we make the gifts a sideshow on a stage on Sunday morning. Oh, look at that. And we turn the gifts of God into a freak show like there are toys instead of the tools of God they're meant to be. Listen, primarily, the, the gifts of God, the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts in your life, are not meant for Sunday morning. They're meant for Wednesday afternoon at 2.15 when your co-worker is losing her mind because her husband just left her and the Spirit speaks to you and you can deliver a prophetic word to her that gives her hope. That's what the gifts of God are designed for in your life. They're not toys for Sunday. They're tools for the rest of the week. Now look, we see a demonstration of God's gifts here on Sunday. We do. In order, everybody say in order. in order, in order, but the reason we do that is we are equipping you in here on Sunday to take the tools into the world. You practice on Sunday in here. This is really practice for the world, okay? So you practice in here on Sunday to take the tools into the world for the rest of the week. It's not a toy. It's a tool. We've got, we've got to get that. And if a Christian is going to be frustrated. And I believe there are so many frustrated Christians in this room right now. I don't know. You're going to hear this message today and clap, and you're going to go home, and you're going to sit on your couch, and you're going to be so frustrated. I just don't know what my purpose is. I don't know how God is going to use me. I Listen, I've been there. I know that. I am reading somebody's mail right now. I, I, I'm just so frustrated. You want me to tell you on your couch how to end your spiritual frustration in an instant, get up off the couch and start using your spiritual gift of, of I don't know, hospitality to greet people in our parking lot on Sunday morning and show them love that they maybe not felt for a month. You want to you wanna end your frustration? Get up off your couch and use your gift of service to pick boxes up at the food bank on Saturday morning so that we can reach a lost and dying world. You want to end your frustration, get up off the couch and deploy the toll. Use what God has given you. Sometimes you just need to use what God's put in your hand and the rest will make sense along the way. Stop trying to figure out your destiny. Stop trying to know the end game and just know the next step. Deploy the toll. Deploy the tool. So your first message point is the gifts of God, they're not toys. They are tools. So what are they? What are the gifts? Listen, there are multiple lists in the Bible. I'm going to read the most prominent of them, but there are spiritual gifts that are beyond this list, and I believe there are also spiritual gifts that aren't even listed in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. And we're going to slow down a little bit here and get through this, okay? It says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Say each of us. It's given to each of us so that we can, what? Help each other. There it is again. I'm not making this stuff up. You're comforted to be a comfort. So that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. Now, most translations of the Bible say that one person is given the word of wisdom. What is a word of wisdom? A person with the gift of the spiritual gift of the word of wisdom has the ability to speak 
heaven's wisdom into a person's situation. Right? The Bible goes on. And by the way, if you've got that gift, that's why people are always coming to you for advice. The gifts attract what, what fulfills them, right? To another, the same spirit gives a message of special knowledge. Most translations say a word of knowledge. Now, what is the word of knowledge? The word of knowledge is the ability to speak the truths of the Bible and Scripture into a person's particular situation. That's a word of knowledge. Somebody will come to you with a problem, and you'll say, well, the Bible says this. Right? And often... <clears throat> The, the gifts of the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom work together, but not always. Sometimes you can have one or the other, but often it's both. The Bible goes on, and it says the same spirit gives great faith to another. A person with the spiritual gift of faith. Well, let me just say this. Everybody has faith. The Bible says you all have a measure of faith. You've got faith, but some people can believe God for it. Great things over and over and over again. This is why some of you are so visionary. Because you have got the gift of faith. You picture it and you think, okay, why not? You've got the gift of faith, right? The Bible goes on and says, to another, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles. And I'm just going to be honest with you. This is where I've been a little bitter with God lately. <laughs> because I want that gift. I, I want the gift of being able to lay hands on someone and see the Holy Spirit heal them. And it's not that I've never seen people healed because I prayed for them or in my ministry. I have. But spiritual gifts happen systematically. They're, they're normal. And that's not, that's not normal for me. And so I said, God, why won't you give me that gift? And you know what the Lord said? He told me two things. The first thing he said is, because your church isn't a one-man show, and I have gifted people in your congregation with that gift. That's the first. We're part of a body. And the second thing he said to me is, Jason, I've not given you the gift of healing and miracles. I've not given you the ability to heal their bodies, but I've given you the ability to heal them with your words. And, and so the next gift is mine, He's, and it's to another, is given the ability to prophesy. The spiritual gift of prophecy <clears throat> is the ability to hear heaven's voice. What is heaven saying? It's not always telling the, the future. It can be that. But what is heaven saying in any moment? The person with the prophetic gift can walk into a room and hear what heaven is saying. They can talk to a person and they can hear what heaven is saying. It's not that they, they know what you're doing necessarily. It's they hear what heaven is saying to you. Heaven knows what you're doing and they're just repeating what they're hearing, right? That is the gift of prophecy. It goes on and says... To another is given the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. So the spiritual gift of discernment, if you have this, you are able to read people and know whether they're of God or not. Or you're able to read a situation and know whether the situation is of God or not. Two ways, maybe both, maybe one or the other. You can read a situation or you can read people. That's the gift of discernment. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, or most translations say to speak in tongues. Everybody say, uh-oh, uh -oh. to speak in tongues, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. And if there are any spiritual gifts or any verses in the Bible that have caused debate, confusion, and consternation, it's the ones on speaking in tongues and the interpretation. So can I talk to you about that real quick? I want to arm you with really good information here, right? So first, what is it? <clears throat> the, the gift of tongues. When you see it demonstrated, it usually looks like this. You're in a room of people, maybe a room this large. It could be a smaller group. And there's like a holy hush that falls over the room. And a person stands in this holy moment. And they speak a language in a tongue. Now, the, 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 the language could be a language that we speak on earth, just in our case, not English. Um, or it could be what the Bible calls in the language of the angels or the tongues of angels, right? And, and so they speak this language, and they don't know what they're saying, and nobody knows what they're saying. You just know God's saying something, right? And then a person with the gift of interpretation. Paul said in a church setting, where tongues is given, there should be an interpretation. And so the person with the gift of interpretation will then stand 
and the Holy Spirit will tell them what to say. And it is powerful and it is incredible. It has been abused by my people. I will freely admit that. But when it's real, it will blow your socks off. And I pray for that to happen in this church. Let me be clear on that, okay? And, and so the confusion comes in with, well, I heard somebody speak it in tongues, but there was no interpretation given, right? And, and, and sometimes the, there, there is an idea called a prayer language, and people may be just praying to themselves. That's not what we're talking about here. That's scripture. I don't have time to talk about that. You can come find me if you want to talk about that. But, but when an interpretation is not given to a clear message in tongues, one of two things is happening. Either the person who gave the original tongues is in the flesh and it wasn't of God, or the person who has the gift of interpretation didn't, wasn't obedient, didn't stand up and didn't interpret. Okay? And, and so that's, that's how that works. Now, I have also heard, well, not all gifts are for everybody. Like, I don't have the gift of healing. I, I wish I had that. I've got to stop coveting my neighbor's house. I know. <laughs> I've heard people say, well, the gift of tongues isn't mine. It isn't for me. And maybe it's not. Maybe. Or m maybe you need to check yourself and ask God if you're just afraid of giving God complete control. Right? You're afraid of looking silly. But maybe it's not. And that's fine. Not, listen... Not everybody has the spiritual gift of tongues. Okay? Not everybody does. But then where we pervert this is we say, well, then I don't have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Two different things. Because remember, the Holy Spirit primarily manifests in three ways. There is the gifts of the Spirit, which some are for you and some aren't. There is the fruit of the Spirit, which all of them are for you. And then there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about for next week's uh, gathering. And it is for every single Christian. Amen. Scripture makes clear that the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is for you. It compels you to welcome the baptism of the Spirit into your life. It almost commands you. But we'll talk about that next week. I just need you to understand there is a difference between the spiritual gift of tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Two different things. So, so there, I hope that helps some of you. So there you have it. There's our list. It's in 2 Corinthians. And it's a nice list with borders and margins. And it's great. Here's the thing I know about the Holy Spirit. is when the Holy Spirit starts to working, sometimes the list gets thrown out the window. When the Holy Spirit gets working, things get messy. You know, like, you know, you'll come home from, from church and you'll be like, I heard somebody speaking in tongues today, but I didn't hear an interpretation. What was that? Or a couple of weeks ago on Miracle Sunday, which I think is probably the most powerful Sunday we ever had in our church, you all lame people left here walking that day. There's, there are other miracles I may share with you at a later date. I need to investigate some of them. It's a powerful Sunday, and I remember the Lord just told me to tell you there's fire in this water. And then people came up into our baptismal, and they started getting baptized in their street clothes. And it was incredible. And I left that day thinking, I've never seen anything like that. You know, that was, that was messy. I'm like, God, where's that in the Bible? Where is that? And you know what the Lord just spoke to me, and God said, God said, Jason, you need to get out of your head and just let me move. You just let me move how I'm going to move. What the Spirit spoke to me is this. The Spirit said, get ready for messy. If we want to see revival, we got to get ready for messy. So I'm getting ready for messy. In a couple of weeks, we're doing another baptism. And I want to tell you, we're going to do another miracle Sunday. God was so powerful the last time he did it. I want to see what God does again. He's led me to declare it as another miracle Sunday. And he said the fire will be in the water again. If you need to be baptized or you need a miracle, I would show up at church that day. Get ready for messy. Get out of your head and let's see what the Holy Spirit is going to do. So I started thinking about the wise men. You know, the ones you only hear about at Christmas time. And, and so speaking of messy, preachers aren't supposed to preach about the wise men in June. But the Lord brought to my mind the wise men who brought their gifts 
their what? Their gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense to lay at the feet of Jesus. And, and when I read that verse, I just did a quick word study. And the Greek word for wise men is magos. Everybody say magos. Magos. It should sound familiar to you. It's where we get the word magi. That's why we call them the magi. Here's the problem. Every other time in the New Testament, the word magos is used. It's never, ever used as wise men. This is the only place in the New Testament where the word magos is called wise men. Everywhere else, it's translated as this. And this is the actual meaning. As magician or sorcerer. And that tripped me out a little bit. Because originally, it wasn't wise men coming to see Jesus. It was magicians and sorcerers coming to see Jesus. Everybody say, get ready for messy. Oh, that blew my mind when I read that. Uh, because in, in Jesus' day... Magicians were not somebody that you would see books about and how little kids would go to Hogwarts School of Magic and save the world. That wasn't their day. In Jesus' day, their books were about how you kill magicians and sorcerers. And so you've got these, these magicians and sorcerers coming to see Jesus. But we call them wise men. But that wasn't their title. That wasn't what you called them in the moment. They were magicians and sorcerers in the moment. And I started thinking about this. What, what, is, what is the message here? And then I realized it's this. What if, what if the reason we call them wise men today is because those magicians and sorcerers were simply obedient back in the day? What, what if they didn't care what you call it? What if they didn't care if we called them a wise man, a magician, or a sorcerer? Their, their idea was, I'm just going to be obedient with my gift in this moment. I'm just going to do what God says to do with my gift in this moment. And you can call it what you want to later. I'll let history judge me later. What if the reason we call them wise men today is just because they were obedient back then and didn't care what we call it? Write this down. Here's another message point for you. Stop caring about what you call it and just be obedient. Stop caring about your title. I'm not a pastor. I, I'm, I'm not a preacher. Stop caring about your title and just be obedient. Stop caring about what it's called and just do what God is saying to do. And let history judge the rest. Well, I don't know if this is pastor tested and deacon approved. Stop caring about what it's called and just be obedient. Do what God is leading you to do in your gifts. I want to finish this morning by reading to you, recapping verse 7. Because maybe you're thinking, well, I don't know what my gift is. I don't even know if I have a gift. You know, I don't have any formal training or whatever. Neither did the disciples. That's okay. By the way, if you don't know your gift, this is another reason you should become a partner. Here's another plug for you, because when you become a partner here and you click that button, we're going to give you your spiritual gifts. We're going to assess you. And if you're a partner here and you maybe have forgotten your spiritual gifts, then you can find some help at the next steps table as you leave today, and we will help you remember your spiritual gifts. Okay, we've got them. We keep all of that. But here's what verse 7 says. It says a spiritual gift is given to how many of us? Each of us. Each of us. Not just to the wise man, not just to the preacher man, but to every man and every woman a gift is given. The Bible goes on in verse 11 and it says, The Holy Spirit alone decides as which gift each person should have. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10 says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. There it is in the scripture over and over and over and over again. Each of us have a gift. You've got a gift. You've got a gift. Your mama's got a gift. You've got a gift. We're all gifted. This is your last message point of the morning. You're gifted. You're gifted. Look at your neighbor. Help me preach this and tell them, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm gifted. Tell them, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm gifted. I've got skills. I'm gifted. You're gifted. You are gifted. Take the test. Become a partner. Take the test. Find out your gift. You're gifted. Listen. Listen. Before, before the wise men were wise men, they were gifted. 
before Billy Graham was preaching to hundreds of thousands of people in packed out coliseums across the world, when Billy Graham was in the hayfields of North Carolina, he was gifted. Didn't have a title, but he was gifted. Before your wise grandma was your wise grandma, she was gifted. Before Jesus was ever called teacher or rabbi one time, before Jesus ever resurrected a person from the dead or healed a blind man, Jesus at the age of 12 is in the temple and Jesus is preaching to the religious leaders of his day. You want to know why he's doing that? Because he's gifted at the age of 12. When I, was, I remember when I was 15 years old and my, my family would leave the house. I was in the house by myself. I would go through my house, preaching in my house, preaching to myself and the angels who were listening. You know why I was doing that at the age of 15? Because I was gifted. You are gifted. The gift of God is inside of you. Everybody say me. me. Say I'm gifted. I'm gifted. You have the gift of God in you. Now what are you going to do with it? Treat it as a toy for you to enjoy or treat it as a tool? For you to deploy. Why don't you stand and we're going to land this plane. I want to prepare you. This is a holy moment. So I want you to just give this moment the attention it deserves. We're about to do the strangest altar call I've ever done. <laughs> the Lord spoke to me this week, gave me clear instructions. Here's some setup. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says, and, and, and by the way, this is an old, grizzled Apostle Paul writing to the young fella, Pastor Timothy. And here's what he says. He says, Fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Fan into flames the spiritual gift I, God gave you when I laid my hands on you. So there's something about the laying on of hands that, that activates gifts. But Paul says, fan it into flames. Fan the gifts into flames. That's interesting. This is 2 Timothy. In 1 Timothy, Paul, a younger Paul, writes to Timothy and says to dust off the gifts. Dust off the gifts. But then years later, Paul says, fan into flame the gifts that were given to you when I laid my hand on you. Fan into flame the gifts. I thought that was interesting, and the Lord just spoke to me and said, Jason, you've, over the last several weeks with what you've seen, you've been dusting off the gifts. He said, but I charge you on this Sunday to fan into flame the gifts of Renaissance Church. That's what he said. I thought about how when I was a little boy, <clears throat> our family heated our house with wood heat. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We had an old buck stove fireplace. And you'd wake up in the morning to go to school at like 6, 6.15, and it'd be 50 degrees in the house. Anybody know what it's like to wake up and see your breath above your bed, you know? That's not the Holy Spirit, that's your breath, okay? And as I got older, as I got older and learned to tend the fire, I would get up. I started by getting up and taking the poker and poking the embers, trying to get the embers to catch fire. You know, Paul called it dusting off. What I was doing, I was poking the embers. And what we've been doing as a church is we've been poking the embers. Tr try trying to get the Holy Spirit to move it. We've been poking the embers. My mama came in one morning and saw me poking the embers. And she said to me, she said, you're doing it wrong. I said, what do you mean? She said, you don't poke the embers. You fan the embers if you want to get a fire back. I said, what? And then my mama took out this thing called a bellow and she said watch this woo 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 and in about five seconds the fire poof, ignited because she fanned the flames I find it so interesting that the Bible when it translates Holy Spirit calls him the Numa 
or the breath of God. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, for the breath of God to fall on this congregation. God, I pray that you would blow across this congregation, fan into flames the gifts that are in every one of your people here, Lord. Give us courage to use your gifts. Show us what our gifts are. Confirm in us we don't need a title. We just need to be obedient. Fan us, God. Fan us. Let the fire from this place be a fire that ignites revival in the triad. Fan us, Lord. And Paul said, fan into flames. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I'd like for my prayer team to come up. Come on, guys. Let's go. So this is what the Lord clearly told me to do today. The Lord said, find gifted, find people who are gifted with a unique spiritual gift. So these are people who I have seen exercising, I've seen it regularly, the gifts that are on them. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, and I'm going to go across this, this group of people up here. I'm going to ask you, the Lord said this is a time for demonstration and impartation. So if you need, you have a need that one of these giftings touches, you come find them. If you have that gift in your life and you want to see God use it more regularly, that's the impartation piece. It's the laying on of hands piece and they'll pray for you. So let them know when you come pray with them. But here on the end, we have Miss Carol and she has an ability to lay hands on people and they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so if you need that, come see Miss Carol. My brother Bill here has the gift of prophecy. He can speak heaven into a situation. And so if you need heaven to speak into your situation, come see him. Or if you want that gift activated in you, come see him. Here we have Miss Susan with the gift of shepherding and leadership. If you have people that you lead, maybe in your family or maybe at the workplace or the ball field, and you need guidance in leading them or you want to see that gift activated in you, come see her. Here we have Pastor Tian, our amazingly gifted worship leader. If you have the spiritual gift of music and arts and want to see that activated, come see him. Over here we have Pastor Jeremy. This guy lays his hands on people. I'm so jealous of this. And they get healed. And so if you need healing, come see Pastor Jeremy. Pastor Randall has the gift of apostleship and entrepreneurship. He can see things. He can see possibilities and he can activate that in you. So come see him. Here we have Pastor William. Pastor William has the gift of discernment. And so if you're in a situation or you're confronted with a person and you need to know if they're of God, then come see him. Or if you want that gift activated in you, come see Pastor William. Here we have Pastor Thomas. Who has the ability? This man has gotten so many people in the church. He has the gift of evangelism. If you've got somebody in your life you need saved, come get prayed for by this man. If you want that gift, start up in you. Come see this man. Here we have Pastor James and Pastor Stephanie. And, and Pastor James has the gift of spiritual deliverance. Listen, if you are being attacked spiritually and you need somebody to join with you in fighting that off, come see these two pastors and they will help you. This is a time of impartation and demonstration. I believe God is about to blow across this auditorium because it's not about me. This is about the body doing what the body does. These people are proven. They are miracle workers. If you need it, come and get it. Let's sing. Find your person. Find your person. Let's go, let's go.
listen, listen. I'm just hearing the Spirit say this. There, there's somebody here and things are supernatural, weird things are happening in your house. And it's, it's, it's scaring you and freaking you out. You need to claim your house back. You need to come up here and pray for the deliverance of your house. That's you, come on.
this is the Holy Spirit moving among you. See, this isn't weird, this is beautiful. This is God being God in our midst. So what do you do when you see the Holy Spirit move? You, you worship, you pray for the people who are up here. Maintain the holiness and sanctity of the moment. You don't have your phone out.
encourage you all to reach your hands this way and let's pray for this family up here. Father, in the name of Jesus, we as a church come to you and we pray for release, restoration, for the darkness to lift, for joy to flow. you to lead us in the bridge in the course of that. Let's just sing it without any music, okay? So listen, we're going to declare these things through faith. When we're done, the band is going to keep playing. You stay and pray as long as you need to. The Holy Spirit is here. If you want to join me for lunch with the pastor, you can do that. But declare these things through faith with me. We'll go back into this song, okay? Say this. I believe God's word about what I have, all that I can do, and who I can be. Therefore, I am physically fit, emotionally equipped, and financially free. The fight was over before it started, and the devil picked the wrong family. My fear is replaced with power, my sorrow with joy, and my guilt with grace. This week, I will find family, pursue purpose, share my 